Well, hi, everybody. It's good to be with you. Uh, my name is Larry Lamb, and I want to greet my fellow laborers of the gospel at the Christian Leaders Fellowship Online Worldwide Conference. What a joy to be with you again, and thank you for inviting me as your speaker. The session of this empowerment talk. Don't you love that empowerment talk? I want to talk to you about being resilient today, not only in life, but specifically in ministry. Everybody gets knocked down, but not everybody gets up. Sometimes the difference between victory and defeat in any endeavor of life is the emotion of resilience. Now, how do people keep going when their hopes are dissolved? Or maybe there's family trauma or physical aches and pains of life or some failure or some embarrassing sin. How do you keep going? One word, resilience. Devotion to the Lord Jesus, be resilient. Overcoming agony in life, be resilient. You get criticized. I, every person in ministry, every, every one of you watching this right now, in the ministry, you are going to get criticized. What are you going to do? Well, I would say this, be resilient. You're charting a new direction in life, a new charting of vision in life for your ministry that God's given you. Be resilient. And so I want to challenge you to read your Bible, and every time you come across someone who is overcome by a great adversity, strong headwinds, tough season, write this word in the margin of your Bible resilient. They overcame something. And we're all going to have to do that. One of life's biggest decisions comes on the heels of adversity. And we can sink into self-pity or plan the next steps because we are resilient. Yes, we can do that. And so the, the last time, uh, perhaps you read through the Bible and, and together you read about Paul and Barnabas were run out of town because of slander and arguments. And the mob of people told Paul and Barnabas, get out of here. And they left and they went to a place called Iconium. In Acts chapter 13 to the very end of the book of Acts, there are some commonalities kind of woven into the fabric of the text. You'll see people, places, mixed reactions to the gospel, defense of the truth, travel, suffering, all kinds of things that go into your life and my life as well. Now, here's what's going on in Acts. John, Mark, an assistant to Paul and Barnabas, for some reason left the team, sailed back to Jerusalem. Paul had been slandered, embroiled in incessant arguments with people over the gospel, run out of town, and then he and Barnabas headed back for the city of Iconium. And after a season of some, uh, one, somebody leaving the team and slander and hot, hot arguments, it, it'd be time to reevaluate direction. Hey, hey, leader, let me ask you something. Have you ever done that? You ever evaluated your direction in life? You've, you've prayed, you've sought direction, you've sought counsel, you're going, am I going the right direction? Is our church going the right direction? Is our ministry going the right direction? Am I doing the right thing? And you begin to evaluate. 
Acts chapter 14 in verse 1 talks about this, about suffering and trials and setbacks and then being resilient. The Bible says, Acts chapter 14, verse 1, the same thing happened in Iconium. Well, what was the same thing? Pain, suffering, trials, the rebuke of the gospel. It says, Paul and Barnabas went to the Jewish synagogue and preached such power that a great number of both Jews and Greeks became believers. Some of the Jews, however, spurned God's message and poisoned the minds of Gentiles against Paul and Barnabas. But the apostles stayed there a long time, preaching boldly about the grace of the Lord. And the Lord proved their message was true by giving them power to do miraculous signs and wonders. Hey, wouldn't you love to have been there? Oh, I would have. It goes on to say, but the people of the town were divided in their opinion about them. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. So here's what's taking place. Luke's account of what happened to Paul in the new location is nothing but a repeat of the draining circumstances from the last place they were in. And it doesn't appear to be the complete story, Paul and Barnabas, but let's be wise enough to know that changing a location, a church, a job, a school, doesn't always solve our problems. Church leaders, sometimes when we're embroiled in some problem, some controversy, some criticism, one of the easiest things we can do is say, you know what, I think God's done with me here. Now, that may be the case, but it's better to leave an, a, a place on a high, on a when, when things are going well, than very low than at the bottom. That's just a wise thing to do. And so if we're the problem, then a new location is irrelevant since it's only a matter of time before the same troubling issue surfaces again. And so the hatred for the Apostle Paul, Barnabas, and the gospel of Christ was so intense that this happened. Now, let me pause right here and say this before I read Acts chapter 14 and verse 5. Some of you watching this today, you are in a country where persecution is increasing and the hostility for the things of God, the things of Christ, the Word of God. And I just want to, I just want to tell you, thank you for your boldness. Thank you for your courage. Uh, thank you that you're not quitting. Thank you in the empowerment talk. You are empowered to go do what God wants you to do, where God wants you to do His work, how God wants you to do His work, in the power, in the presence, and the purpose of the Holy Spirit of God. You stay at it. You stay at that because you're doing a wonderful work. And like Paul and Barnabas and other believers in the book of Acts, was there persecution? Yes. Uh, was there a hostile crowd against the gospel of Christ? Yes. Did they stop preaching the gospel of Christ? No. Acts 14 verse 5 says, Then a mob of Gentiles and Jews, along with their leaders, decided to attack and stoned them. And when the apostles learned of it, they fled to the region of Lyconia, to the town of Lystra and Derby and the surrounding area. Verse 7. And there they preached the good news. They were wise enough to go to another location, but they didn't stop doing what God had called them to do. I would encourage you, wherever you're watching this today, you stay at it. You keep the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in your life. Don't back up. Don't quit. Don't stop. You keep going forward. God's going to do something in your life, in my life, that only could be described as, look what God did. And so Paul and Barnabas were tipped off of the imminent attack and stoning, and they left Iconium. That's a wise move. Stoning is not designed to hurt someone. Stoning is designed to kill someone. And so they didn't want to be stoned that day. They wanted to keep preaching the gospel. Here's something we should all be catching and getting a hold of about Paul and Barnabas as we follow them around the various regions and cities and acts. Boldness for Jesus will not always afford us popularity. If your goal in life is to be popular in the ministry, seek something else. 
It's not about how popular we are, but how popular Jesus Christ is in his life living in and through us. And so while in Lystra, Paul healed a man who had been crippled since birth. And when the people saw this, they began to shout to Paul and Barnabas that they're human gods, and they begin to praise them. And the Greek mythology was so common that Barnabas was named Zeus and Paul was named Hermes, and they started to worship them with sacrifices. It's like, no, stop, stop, stop. In Acts 14, 15, they said, friends, why are you doing this? And I love Paul's humility because he says, we're merely human beings just like you. We've come to bring you the good news that you should turn from these worthless things and turn to the living God who made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. Hey, let me give you a couple of some life realities in this empowerment talk. If the living Lord uses us in a powerful way, it is because of him, not us. Let's not be impressed with what happened. Let's not be overly built up and say, wow, look what this is. Let's be moved by what for a brief time or longer season that God would use us in the life of someone else. I love what Thomas Constable said. He said, if Satan cannot derail Christian witness, with persecution, he will try praise. If God is using you in a great way today, just bow your head and say, God, thank you. Thank you in humility that you would use me wherever you are on the globe right now, that God would use you, that God might use me in a simple way to touch the people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wow, we are, we are clay and he is the potter. Second thing I want to mention is this. The good news or the gospel still causes people to turn from what is worthless to the one who is worthy of the creator. Wherever you're watching this today, you know you're around people who need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whatever language it may be, whatever your culture, whatever your, whatever your language, whatever the style of ministry is in the church or ministry that you are in, God wants to use you and me still to bring the gospel, the life-changing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ in your city, in your community, in your town, in your urban area, in your out-of-the-way place, you may think there are people who need the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I like that Paul and Barnabas deflected praise away from themselves and pointed the people to the living God who created them into all creation. And take a look at the last two words in verse 15. He said, worthless thing. Turn from worthless things. Notice Luke says worthless things, not worthless people, but worthless things. People made in the image of the living God are not worthless, but all have worth. I love to travel around the world and encourage pastors and develop pastors, equip pastors. I mean, I just, I, we hop on an airplane, we'll fly 15, 16 hours somewhere around the world. And we get there and we're with, a, we're with a group of pastors and church leaders. And I get so excited. I, 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 we're praying. We're, we're together. We're going to see God work together. We're going to encourage one another. We're going to learn from each other's ministry and how to do a better job. We're in that culture that we're at. And so it's not worthless people. We're encouraging people to turn, turn from worthless things. Anything that we place intrinsic value while hoping it will satisfy our longing for purpose and peace and fulfillment, that's worthless. Searching for significance in this world is like trying to find clear drinking water in a sewer. No, not worthless people, worthless things. All people are loved by the living God. Here's the final frame of chapter 14. This is so exciting. The mob of people that ran Paul and Barnabas out of town in Antioch and Iconium followed them all the way to the community of Lystra. Now they are, they are chasing after Paul and Barnabas. Here we go, Acts chapter 14, verses 19 and 20. It says this, 
Then some of the Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowds to their side. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of town, thinking he was dead. Verse 20, but as the believers gathered around him, he got up. Did you see that? He got up and went back into the town. The next day he left with Barnabas for Derby. Wow, you talk about resilience. You talk about the encouragement of other believers when he was stoned. They thought he was dead. He was, it was bleeding and bruised and cut and lying there. And the believers, the believers gathered around him. And maybe they said, come on, Paul, get up. Come on, Paul, you can do it. Come on, Paul, we've got a work for Christ to do. Come on, Paul, don't quit now. Come on, Paul, stay at it. We're here to help you. We're going to raise you up. You, you need people like that in your life. I need people like that in my life when we're at our very lowest. Those three words in Acts chapter 14 have meant so much to me. He got up. See, being resilient isn't about getting bruised in life because everybody gets bruised in life somehow, physically, emotionally, mentally. Being resilient isn't about trying something new and failing because we all fail. My goodness, if I had the time, I could tell you all the failures in the last 38 years of ministry going, that you, you'd say, why did you do that? Well, I, I did, I did. Well, you, you know what though? You gotta be resilient. Being resilient isn't about having something uh, go wrong in life because everybody has things go wrong in life. Being resilient isn't about having perfect relationships because everybody has an occasional relationship chaos. Being resilient isn't about failing a, a class or some ministry opportunity because you know what? We're all going to fail at some point. Being resilient isn't about never sinning because the Bible says, for all have sinned. There are three words in verse 20, as I said, that mean so much to me. It describes the person with a resilient spirit. Can I ask you a question today? Wherever you're watching this at, do you have a resilient spirit? Are you, are you almost at the end where you're saying, I don't know if, I don't know if I'm going to stay at it. I don't know if I'm going to, I don't, I don't know if we're going to stay at this church. I don't know if we're going to stay in the ministry. I'm just about ready to quit. And I would tell you, don't, 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 don't be resilient. Summon your courage, be resilient. I'll, I'll help you any way I can. I'll encourage you. I'll pray for you. Uh, I, if we could get together somewhere around the world, I would do that. Man, let's get together. Everybody's going to have setbacks. Everybody's going to have failures. Everybody's going to sin. But the Bible says in Acts chapter 14, three words about the Apostle Paul. It says, he got up. Maybe today you need to get up. Maybe today you're very discouraged over something. I would tell you, get up. Maybe you're ready to quit. I would tell you, get up. The disciples gathered around him and Paul got up. And that's, that's not the end of the story. Here's, here's where the act of resilience has a wider swath of impact. After Paul got back up, he and Barnabas went back into the very town they drug him out of. And he made disciples and he preached the gospel. And the Bible says he stayed there because disciples are made not quickly, but over time. So he stayed there a while and they, they retraced their steps back to Lystra and Iconium and the Antioch and Poseida. And all along the way, they encouraged the believers to continue in the faith and never forget, never forget the suffering and the hardships are a part of life. Be resilient. And they appointed elders, they traveled back through Poseidon and Pamphylia, and they preached in Perga, and they got on a ship in Antelia, and they began a long trip back to Antioch, Syria. And then in Acts chapter 14, verse 26, it said they finally returned by ship to Antioch of Syria, where they journey, <laughs> the journey had begun, and the believers there had entrusted them to the grace of God to do the work they had now completed. Upon arriving in Antioch, they called the church together. And they reported everything God had done through them, and He had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles too. And they stayed there with the believers for a long time. Verse 20, though, 
says he got up. It's not the end of the story. Just like the termination or the divorce or the breakup or the harsh words or the criticism of an emotional breakdown, that's not the end of the story. Painful, it is painful, but it's not the end of the story. Here, here's what makes someone resilient. Are you ready to be resilient? I want to be resilient. I want you to be resilient. It's what they do in their life after they get back up. See, everybody's going to get knocked down, but not everybody gets back up. Acts chapter 14, verse 20, all the way to the end of the book of Acts chapter 28, discovered that Paul did at least, I counted them one day, did at least 41 significant things in his life after he got up. Life is a school. Problems are the curriculum, according to Rick Warren. Four thoughts as we wrap this up about someone who is resilient. Number one, They'll look back on their life and be grateful that they got up. You, you, you're you're going to get up. I believe you're going to get up. If you're, you're discouraged today, you're going to get back up. You can get God's word, get some good prayer partners around you, say, you know what? I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to be a resilient church leader all the way to the very end of the days of my life that God has given me. And you know what's going to happen? God's going to use you in a greater way. God's going to expand your testimony. God's going to expand your life. God's going to expand your ministry. God's going to infuse new hope into you. He's going to give you favor, blessing, and anointing. And you're going to do more for the living God after you got back up than before you did get hurt or pain or set back. He will. I believe that. Number two, people that get back up, they're going to look back on their life. And at some point, see, not, not all, not all of the people who were inspired and influenced to build a greater life for the glory of God. There will be people that will come up to you at some point unannounced. You didn't plan it. You didn't schedule it, but they're going to walk into your life and they're going to say something like this. Hey, church leader, pastor, friend, thank you for not giving up. Thank you for preaching the gospel. Thank you for doing the work. Thank you for studying hard. Thank you for being resilient in your life. I am a benefactor because you did not quit. Number three, they'll look back and see how God used others to help them get back up. There are people who are going to watch your life and they're going to see you encouraged. They're going to see you anointed. They're going to see God's favor upon you. They're going to see God using you, empowering you, the empowerment conference. There are going to be people who are watching your life, who know the details of your life. And they're going to say, if you can do it, I can do it. Thank you for your encouragement. Number four, the final point is they'll look back and they'll see how the living Lord never abandoned them in their darkest seasons of life. Oh, I tell you, God's working on your testimony. God's working on my testimony. The first, the first four letters of the word testimony, it's the word test. And God's going to test all of us. He's going to refine us like pure gold, scrape off the dross and the impurities that your life and ministry and my life's going to come forth like gold. And the reflection won't be us. The reflection will be the living Christ. One last scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 8 says, Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Oh, listen, friend, where, again, wherever you're at, all over the globe today, all over this world, whatever country you're in, whomever you are watching this with, may you be encouraged. When this message is over, maybe you bow your head and you say, Jesus, I find myself drawn to you. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. You are my friend. You called me into ministry. You, you have anointed me for the work ahead of me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I am more than a conqueror because I am in Christ Jesus. Your word protects me. It protects my mind and my heart and my soul. I am victorious. I am not a victim. 
I am a victor because of the cross of Jesus Christ. I just want to say thank you again for the invitation to be a part of this wonderful organization. May God bless you as you go forward in life. And may you get up today and do the work that God has called you to do. Get up. And if you know somebody who's down, you come around them. Help them back up. Pray for them. Encourage them. Give them hope. And may they keep their eyes on Jesus Christ as you keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. And we'll all do it together, perhaps in different countries, different languages, a different culture, all for the one and only Savior, Jesus, our Lord, and the living, soon coming Christ. God bless you as you go forward for Him.